Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Ivy. I am the Special Education Program Coordinator at Hebrew Free Loan Society. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about how the DOE funds private school tuition, um, which is through reimbursement, and how the Hebrew Free Loan Society can bridge any financial gaps for families going through this process. Uh, the Hebrew Free Loan Society is a nonprofit organization that helps low and moderate income New Yorkers achieve financial stability and access financial opportunity by providing 0% interest, no fee loans to meet a wide array of needs. HFLS is and always has been non-sectarian, assisting borrowers regardless of religion, nationality, or immigration status. I'll be discussing one type of loan in particular, the Special Education Bridge Loan. Um, I will go into more detail um, later in the session, but we'll mention now that this loan is different from even other Hebrew free loans in that you, the borrower, do not actually pay these loans, repay these loans yourselves. And I'll again go into the specifics of that later in the session. Um, in addition to my work at Hebrew Free Loan, I'm also the parent of a special needs child um, who attends a special education school. Um, we started the process in kindergarten and she just started sixth grade. Um, so I'd be the first one to admit that this is an incredibly confusing and overwhelming process at times. Um, I've definitely sat here on numerous occasions and just wondered what was happening, what was going on. Um, so it's, you know, I'm just, I'm just glad that I'm able to um, be here and kind of share this information with you. And I'm very thankful to be joined by Adam Dion, a special education attorney who is going to help make sense of the steps, the timeline, the results, um, talk about some resources and basically provide all the information I wish I had when I first started this whole, um, this whole process. Um, Adam's, special Adam's interest in special education was sparked by his research on autism as an undergraduate student and enhanced by his fundraising efforts directed toward the education of individuals uh, with autism. Over the past 13 years, the law offices of Adam Dion has represented individuals with a wide range of special needs and has become one of the premier boutique special education law practices in New York City. In addition to offering legal services in the area of special education law, the firm offers trust and estate planning services to its clients to make sure that children with special needs receive long-term financial security as well as a quality education. Adam holds a JD from Yeshiva University's Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law. He also holds a BBA from CUNY Baruch College, where he was a Hertog Scholar and a member of the first graduating class of the Macaulay Honors College. Adam is admitted to practice law in New York, as well as the U.S. District Court for the Southern and Eastern Districts of New York. In 2021, Adam launched a podcast called Curious Incident, a podcast for special needs families. As host, Adam interviews experts in the field of special education who can be resources to parents whose children are struggling educationally. Adam resides with his wife in Manhattan. They share an interest in travel, foreign language, and education. And they're having a blast raising their daughter, twin boys, and newborn baby girl. And I will pass it on to Adam. Thank you, Ivy, very much for that introduction. I want to thank everybody for being here, for joining us on this webinar. And I want to say before we start that I know this process can be stressful. And I want everybody joining us to know that there are resources out there. So you're not alone in this process. There are experts, there are lawyers, there are psychologists and therapists and evaluators, and there's Hebrew Free Loan Society, which we're going to discuss tonight. And so I just want you to rest assured that there are resources you can avail yourselves of. My team and I have been doing this work for the last 13 years. We are extremely passionate about helping special needs families navigate the legal process and secure the services that their children are entitled to. And I just want everybody to know that the process of contacting a lawyer doesn't have to be quite so daunting. And I'm hoping that tonight, as we talk a little bit more about the legal process, um, it will seem a little bit less daunting. And just know that there are legal experts to help you navigate this process smoothly. Um, there is a Q&A box 
So if you have any questions, which we'll be happy to address at the end of the presentation, please put them in the Q&A box. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be made available after the presentation for anybody who wants to rewatch it or wasn't able to catch it the first time. We also will be sending a follow-up email with additional information about the presenters um, and uh, slides from this presentation, uh, including contact information for the uh, Ivy and myself. And um, I guess having addressed those items, I'll just segue into the meat and potatoes of my presentation. And before I jump in, I just want to introduce a few key concepts, which I think are really important to give a framework for what we're going to be discussing this evening. And the first concept or concepts that I want to introduce are Carter and Connor's funding. And these are typically discussed in the context of a private school placement, where a family is having to lay out money or incur a financial, a financial obligation to a school for a child's enrollment. And so I want you to understand that Carter funding typically means that where a family is choosing a special education private school, they're laying out the money for the tuition and seeking reimbursement from the school district through the legal process. The other concept of Connor's funding is a little bit different. Connor's funding typically means that a family is working out some sort of financial arrangement with the special education private school, whereby they're paying a reduced tuition amount, or in some cases, no tuition amount, while the legal process is pending, based on the understanding that whatever funding is due to the school, if the family is successful with their case, will go from the school district directly to the school. And so we'll talk a little bit more about this process and the timeline and some of these details, but I want you to remember Carter's funding and Connor's funding. The other thing I want to emphasize is that for any legal case where private school tuition is at issue, there are three prongs that have to be determined, three questions that have to be answered. The first prong or question is, did the school district offer an appropriate public school program and placement. The second question or prong is, did, this, did the parents choose an appropriate private school for their child? And the third prong or question is, did the parents cooperate throughout the entire process with the school district such that equitable considerations justify an award of funding for the private school placement. And so I, I probably said a mouthful, but just to recap, was the school district's program appropriate? If not, was the private school program appropriate? And did the parents cooperate throughout the process? And so there's one final concept that I wanna introduce, and that's the concept of pendency. Some of you on this webinar may be familiar with pendency already. But pendency is a hugely advantageous and powerful tool for parents going through this legal process, because it basically means if you were successful in the first school year litigating your case, you had an impartial hearing and you won your case, then that helps you use that favorable decision and continue your child's placement for subsequent school years and continue the funding for the cost of that program. And so just to break it down, if you win your case in year one, now you're starting year two, you put pendency in place and the school district has to pay the school of your choice for the entire duration of that case, regardless of the final outcome. And so I just wanna stress, it's a hugely advantageous mechanism for keeping funding in place for a special education private school placement. And I know this is gonna be very relevant in the context of Hebrew Free Loan Society because it's one of their eligibility criteria for families securing the bridge loan. And so we'll definitely speak more about that. The final point I'll say before transitioning to the next slide where we'll go through the timeline is that the first year you're going through this process is the slowest and the hardest. And everybody who's starting out should know that. 
And we typically tell clients that you should expect that you're not gonna see any funding from the school district until 12 to 18 months from when your due process complaint was filed. I'll break that down a little bit more, but keep that in mind, 12 to 18 months from the time your complaint was filed until you're able to receive funding from the school district. And part of what we're gonna to discuss tonight is how the bridge loan can help to shorten that time period and help you secure funding while you're waiting for the school district funds to be dispersed. And so I think at this point, we can transition to the slide outlining the special education reimbursement process, which you should be able to see up on your screen now. And so we'll start with the 10-day notice letter. It's referred to TDN for short. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's basically the letter, the document that starts this private school reimbursement process. It's what parents send to the school district to state, you did not provide an appropriate public school program and placement. Therefore, I've chosen a special education private school placement and I'm expecting the school district to fund the cost of my child's private school enrollment. And the law states that this notice letter must be sent out 10 business days in advance of a child's enrollment in a special education private school. So that starts the process. Once the school year starts, the next step is to file an impartial hearing request also known as a due process complaint or DPC for short. And this typically happens in the first month or two of the school year. It builds on the 10 day notice letter. It sets forth all of the allegations as to why the school district did not offer an appropriate program and placement. And it says what actions the parents have taken as a result and what they believe they're entitled to. Following the filing of that due process complaint, there's typically a 30 day resolution period. In theory, it's an opportunity for the school district to resolve the issues in the complaint informally without the need for an impartial hearing or any kind of trial. The problem in New York City is that the people from the school district who attend this resolution meeting typically do not have the authority to resolve monetary issues. And so if the issue is that you're seeking private school tuition funding, they're likely not going to be able to resolve this at the resolution meeting. Following the resolution period, there's two tracks that the case can follow. It can go to the settlement track or to the impartial hearing track. And I'll run through the settlement track. Documents are submitted to the school district if and when it's referred for settlement. That referral typically happens five or six months after the complaint is filed. The school district reviews those documents that the law firm submits, prepares a memo to the New York City Comptroller and seeks pre-approval to negotiate a settlement agreement with the parents' counsel. Once pre-approval is obtained, Settlement negotiations begin back and forth, back and forth to try to reach an agreement. Assuming an agreement is reached, there's some paperwork. This paperwork typically happens around, you can see 13 or 14 months after the complaint was filed. And stipulation is drafted, parent signs, school district counter signs, and then an agreement is in place once the document is executed. It takes a while for the reimbursement process to happen. It happens to be that right now in New York City, the settlement process is a bit faster, a bit more timely, uh, not as many challenges as with the hearing process, but it can still take several months for funding to flow once that settlement agreement is executed. As I said, there's a second track that the case can follow and that's the hearing track. And so you can see around month five or six, we are beginning to prepare for the impartial hearing. That continues through months seven and eight. Then an impartial hearing happens. Appearances are made, witnesses are questioned. Um, the hearing process is completed. At the end of that impartial hearing process, closing briefs are submitted to outline the issues in the case, 
the evidence that was presented and why one party should be favorable or the other. After closing briefs are submitted, the judge reviews the briefs and issues a final written decision. And then assuming the parents were favorable, the reimbursement process uh, happens. And th that's where there's some big challenges right now because the implementation office at the New York City Department of Education is a bit broken and they're not dispersing funds in a timely way. And so it could be many months in between a favorable hearing officer decision and when the school district gets around to dispersing those funds, making a bridge loan from Hebrew Free Loan Society, hugely important because you can secure the funds from Hebrew Free Loan Society, which Ivy is going to speak about. And then later when the funds finally do come through from the school district, those funds will flow directly from the school district back to Hebrew Free Loan Society. And so with that, I will pause and hand it back to Ivy. Thank you, Adam. Um, thank you for a con um, very concise explanation and for kind of tying how Hebrew free loan can, can help families. Um, it's, uh, I will just jump right ahead. Um, so as Adam mentioned, um, you know, even after your, your child's case is closed, um, it can be several months between before you actually get them funding um, you know, due to you from the DOE. Um, this is the case with settlements um, and especially with impartial hearings. Um, it, um, I, yeah, it's uh, with impartial hearings, um, it was definitely an understatement to say they're a bit delayed. Um, but um, so, in, in to, and also another point is that the, in addition to delay, the timing is also erratic. It's very difficult to predict when the DOE will release the funds for your case. Uh, I've seen cases where they're paid out in weeks. Uh, sometimes it takes years. So there's unfortunately um, a wide range of timing you can be dealing with. So um, this is where um, special education bridge loans can come in. Um, and in terms of when you can take a loan out, um, you can take a special education bridge loan out when you receive a execute stipulation or a favorable decision, um, which means your case is closed. We have that legal guarantee from the DOE that your tuition will be reimbursed. And again, as I mentioned, um, more often than not, um, or in, in many cases, tuition is reimbursed. Um, the DOE may agree to Fund your, um, fund your child's tuition at a special education school, or they may end up being legally obligated to, which is, which is wonderful, um, which is amazing. Um, but the catch is, it, it's a reimbursement. So families have to um, come up with this tuition on their own. Um, it's, it can be tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars of a year on tuition. And of course, this puts a strain on many families. I mean, how, how does a family um, you know, have that much money set aside? Just you know, and how are they able to wait indefinitely for it to appear, um, you know, back with them? So it's, um, again, this is where a special education bridge loan can help manage this uncertainty. Um, what, is, what is a bridge loan? A bridge loan um, is a loan that bridges the gap in time when the DOE becomes legally obligated to fund your child's private school tuition and when they actually fund your child's tuition, when they actually paid out the money. The, um, and the timing is when um, the district executes your stipulation or decision, decision is issued. Um, that is when you're able to take out a bridge loan. Um, so in terms of options, um, and this will kind of go into more detail as to how exactly the bridge loan can help your family. Um, the options are to, you can either take out a loan to reimburse yourself for tuition you've been paying all, all along. So it's, you know, like Adam mentioned, you know, the school year is over, almost over, and you finally have a decision or a settlement. Um, you've been paying tuition this whole year. And at this point, you can take out a loan to reimburse yourself that tuition. Um, it's quite a bit quicker than waiting for the DOE to reimburse you. Um, you know, you, at the, the um, payment, the loan is much more immediate than waiting months or years for a DOE. Um, so, that is one option. The other option is to take a loan actually to pay an outstanding balance. 
So if you have a settlement or decision um, before the school year ends and you know, the DOE is able to expedite your case, you can actually take a loan out to pay off that outstanding balance. Um, you know, especially if you have a extended payment plan or a monthly payment plan and you're still paying off that tuition. Um, so that is, um, those are the main, two main options for um, a special education bridge loan. Uh, in terms of disbursement, um, loans to pay you for tuition you've already paid, um, they can be deposited into a checking account. So, you know, once the loan is approved and, you know, all the paperwork is in and, you know, we're ready to disperse, you can actually get the funds in a few days. Um, any loans to pay off as outstanding tuition balance, the check will just be sent directly to the school. Um, just want to mention also that any loans where you're reimbursing yourself for tuition you paid, um, you know, many families use it to pay following year's tuition because you know, the school is asking them for a deposit or they're asking them to start making next year's tuition payments. Um, so this way, um, the money you paid for the first year can be put toward the second year's tuition. Um, we don't require this of families. It's, it's your, their choice. Um, you know, this is money that you've already laid out. So just, um, you know, again, we don't, we don't require this. Um, so let me go over the, um, so in terms of repayment, um, so how are these loans repaid? As I mentioned earlier, the um, bridge loans are not repaid by the borrower. You yourself do not repay this loan. Um, the loans are repaid when the DOE sends um, the settlement funds or decision funds to your, attorney, to your attorney, and they forward those funds to Hebrew Free Loan to repay your loan. Um, so you know, this means that your case needs to be set up in such a way that your attorney has, this, has the funds um, set, up, set, is accepting the funds on your behalf. Um, so it's, um, you know, we don't have a timeline or a schedule for repayment. It's just whenever the DOE gets around to sending the money to your attorney and your attorney you know, um, forwards that, those funds to us to repay your loan. Um, in terms of eligibility criteria, uh, I will just go over those really quick. Um, it's, um, some of the criteria are specific to special education bridge loans. Um, again, the receipt of an executed stipulation of settlement decision or act of pendency order. Uh, uh, pendency can be a confusing concept and I am I'm very um, glad that Adam kind of gave a very concise uh, definition of pendency. Um, but it's basically, where DOE is legally obligated to pay your child's tuition, even though your case is still open and kind of going through a legal process. And because of that obligation, um, we can do loans against pendency to cover tuition that for the school year has already occurred. So it can be a few months tuition because you have a deferment from the school or because you need to reimburse yourself for those few months tuition. Um, we can do a loan against pendency. Um, again, uh, as it per um, previously discussed, um, uh, the you know, attorney needs to be okay with participating in the bridge loan process because they're the ones repaying the loan on your behalf. Um, we have criteria that go across um, special education bridge loans to all HFLS loans. Um, one is to reside in our catchment area, which is the five boroughs in New York, Long Island, and Westchester, and to be of low and moderate income as per our household income limits. Um, this slide will give you our income limits. Um, just look at your household size and the income limits right below it. Um, I will mention that we have some leeway to go above the limits. So, you know, if your income is, you know, 10, 20, $30,000 above what's on the slide, go ahead and apply. You're most likely eligible for a bridge loan. Um, if your income is even higher and you've extenuated circumstances, get in touch. Um, you know, we'll, we'll try and work with you as much as we can. Um, so this concludes our, um, the, the bridge loan portion of the session. Um, we will have a few minutes for Q&A. So let me see if there's any questions that have come up. Ivy, I see there's one question here. If I'm not able to get a loan until the end of the school year and I've paid most or all of the tuition, how does a loan help? And this is actually a, a question that we get often. Um, and I, I think, you know, the answer is twofold. First of all, if you have been laying out funds throughout the year, you can get that money back sooner. Um, secondly, and also if you owe tuition to the school, 
for that school year, you can make sure the school is paid sooner by having this bridge loan. And the other piece of it is that you're going to have to be thinking about the upcoming school year as well. And there are going to be deposit deadlines and tuition payment deadlines. And so having a source of funding through the bridge loan allows you or puts you in a better position to start making those tuition payments for the upcoming school year as well. Absolutely. Um, you know, as a parent, I've always heard the rule of thumb was to have two years tuition kind of before you can receive any funds that start recycling tuition back to future, you know, subsequent years. Um, so it's, um, you've definitely kind of outlined the, the, ex the exact ways in which having a bridge loan can help, even if you've paid um, tuition and the school year's over, almost over. Um, you know, it's, there is some long-term planning involved. And as you said, the, um, the first year is the most difficult but subsequent years are still um, require quite a bit of effort and um, on, on the parents' part. Um, I actually had um, a quick question for you. If, um, you know, you mentioned that the implementation unit is, is broken and payments are quite delayed. Um, I know that the DOE is trying to fix it, um, but I wonder if um, in terms of payment, it will be the, the last thing on their list of things to fix. I mean, where if maybe you have thoughts on kind of what their priority is in terms of fixing the system. Sure. I mean, there is federal litigation pending um, to fix the implementation unit, and um, it's a work in progress, and those wheels of justice move slowly. Uh, right now, the implementation unit, or IU, is understaffed. Uh, they have outdated equipment, and they're really not set up for success. And so if I were to emphasize anything, um, you know, to families about how to get the IU to pay more quickly funds that are owed, I would say, you know, make sure to have all of the documents required for implementation, make sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Information has to be accurate, legible, clear, and um, you, you should, um, minimize the possibility that they're going to notice a discrepancy and then just put it aside or put it to the bottom of the pile. So the more organized everyone can be on the front end to make sure the documents are the way they're supposed to do, uh, supposed to be, to make IU's job easier, the more likely everyone will receive the disbursements sooner. Oh, um, we do have a few more questions. Um, I mean, I'm, we're running a bit tight, but I'm gonna try and answer them as quickly as possible. Um, attorney's fees, um, is the DOE responsible for any of that? Uh, potentially, um, it's you know, something discussed with your attorney, but they do occasionally pay for attorney's fees. Are you able to pay your lawyer to cover the cost of school fees using a bridge loan? Um, fortunately, um, bridge loans do not cover attorney's fees, but um, we do have special, we do have um, general needs loans through HFLS who but that could potentially cover fees. Um, I can send out um, and follow up emails, um, just information about other loan programs. So, and um, this, I believe, unfortunately, I wish we had more time, but- um, I, uh, I can just say a very quick word on the question of legal fees. I think there's two points to emphasize. One is that lawyers do have the ability to recover legal fees from the school district if they're successful with the case. And so that results in typically heavily reduced flat fees for parents. And most firms, um, mine in particular, are willing to work with families based on their financial circumstances. And so if you're in difficult financial circumstances, mention that to your lawyer and probably they'll be able to work with you in some capacity. Yeah, um, so this concludes our information session. Thank, thank you, Adam. Um, thank you all for attending and asking your questions. Uh, we hope you, we provide you with a basic understanding though. Uh, with the legal process, um, for tuition reimbursement and giving you one option for managing the funding piece of it.